I'm like Orrin from the child development side. So a person who's in early childhood education interested in technology. Um, thought I would share a little bit about the new National Association for the Education of Young Children and, and Fred Rogers Center joint position statement. What I think are some of the implications for you as, as designers. The position statement was really written to inform teaching practice in early childhood education. It took about two and a half years to, uh, to get that done. Uh, lots of controversy in the field around what's appropriate with technology. So I'm, I'm calling this apps for DAP, and DAP is developmentally appropriate practice. Uh, and that's kind of the gold standard in early childhood education, and really what Mark was just talking about was what's appropriate for the child. So I wanna, I wanna kind of fit that. So I, as I go through these slides, think about how DAP is your app. How developmentally appropriate are you in the way you're doing your app? Of course, I have to start with a, with a quote from Fred Rogers who said, no matter how helpful computers are as tools, and of course they can be very helpful tools, they don't begin to compare in significance to the teacher-child relationship which is human and mutual. A computer can help you learn to spell hug, but it can never know the risk or the joy of actually giving or receiving one. And I think that's a great reminder from Fred that this is about, and especially with the youngest children, it's about relationships first. It's about interactions between um, children and adults and children with their peers. Uh, and then it's about um, what we do with technology. Um, Fred also talked about the, the need to, um, to use technology in a ways that would encourage conversation, that would build cooperation, and that would expand learning experiences. And, and I've been hearing lots of examples of that all the way through. So the joint position statement, Technology and interactive media as tools in early childhood programs serving children from birth through age eight. It's a mouthful. Um, NAUIC is very good at writing very long titles, but I think there's a lot of key words in there that we want to focus on. Sorry. Come on, go back. One more. There we go. So just quickly, a, um, a wordle from the position statement. Um, and I think, it, I think it's very telling because if you look at, at the balance in the biggest words, right? That's what a wordle does. Look at technology, but look at how it balances out with childhood and children and learning, educators, early media development, that the key words across this position statement on technology include technology, but are about, really about issues around child development. So let's play words with teachers. What were some of the most important key words from the position statement um, as it relates to teachers? Well, the first is that technology is a tool like any other tool in an early childhood classroom. Not more important, not less important, equally important to all the other things we already know how to use. That intentionality, and you're gonna hear this word from me a lot in the next 14 minutes, is a key, key thing. We have to know why we're doing what we're doing. It's not enough to be able to describe what you did, you have to know why you did it, and that's the connection between understanding child development and the work that you do. Is it appropriate for the age and stage of the child? Is it effective? In other words, does it work? Does it actually do what we say it does? Integrating means integrated across the curriculum. The days of a computer lab for young children in a preschool lab are over, I hope. As you have a digital device like an iPad, we don't need to send kids down the hall for their five minutes with a computer anymore. The computer can go where the children are. So integrating technology across the curriculum has just gotten easier than ever. Balanced is this notion of it's not all technology, it's not no technology, it's finding the balance between um, what, what we already do and hold dear in early childhood. Hands-on, of course, is that idea that we're really getting our, our hands on this. Interesting thing for you all to consider. When we were talking about the position statement, early childhood professionals, when they say hands-on, are really thinking sand and manipulative materials. They're thinking kids are really doing something with their hands, and they did not consider manipulating an iPad, hands-on learning. So there's a, there's a shift that we need to be thinking about there, about how, how hands-on is what we're doing. Interactive is important, of course, and that's all what we've been talking about for the last two days. But I would add, as Fred suggested, that it's interactive with interactions. That good, um, good experiences with technology for young children include interactions with others, not just interactive um, experiences with the technology. Engaging, of course, co-engagement, I'll talk about some more, and then empowerment. So the position statement, I, I, uh, I hate to put a lot of words on the screen and just read them, but I think it's important for you to hear this first part. Technology and interactive media are tools that can promote effective learning and development when they are used intentionally by early childhood educators within the framework of developmentally appropriate practice to support learning goals established for individual children. Wow, there's a lot in that one, right? Tools, technology and interactive media, tools promote effective learning, they can, promote effective learning and development when they are used intentionally 
which suggests that when they are not used intentionally, the risk is we'll have the opposite outcome, right? That if we don't think about what we're doing with technology in very young children, we may unintentionally end up with negative outcomes. Children's experience with technology and interactive media are increasingly part of the context of their lives that must be considered as part of the developmentally appropriate framework. This was the breakthrough. Seems obvious to all of you, this is the work that you do. But in early childhood, where there was a lot of skepticism about technology for the youngest children, putting this in the context of developmentally appropriate practice helped people understand that what we were talking about was that this is one more of many experiences that are important for young children. So some key messages, again, intentionally and appropriately, it can be an effective tool. Teachers need information, resources, and ongoing professional development. Here's the challenge for, for myself, for Warren, for others in early childhood. The position statement defines what appropriate and, and uh, intentional practice looks like today in a multi-touch um, digital world, but teacher preparation lags far behind that. So we have teachers who are in um, classrooms with young children who aren't ready to think about this in this way. I think, I think you all can help with that. You'll see what I mean in a, in a minute or two. And that we, we certainly continue to need research to understand this. We have 30 years of research on television and its impact on kids, very little data research on what's this new world like for children. Um, we, we see the headlines. Um, David Kleeman tweeted three different articles yesterday, all challenging whether technology was any good for kids. Um, we, we have these sensational headlines, but we don't have data on either side. Here's an important point. The American Academy of Pediatrics in their, in their statement in November of 2011 said, we've looked at all the research, some's good, some's bad. We don't know. The research is inconclusive about whether technology is good or bad. Since we don't know, we're going to be very, very cautious. And we're going to recommend to parents we're going to strongly, that they strongly discourage use of technology with children under two. We read the same research as we did the position statement, and we said, it's inconclusive. Some's good, some's bad. We don't know. But what we do know is that technology is already in these children's lives. It's part of the context of their existence. We can't wait for the research to tell us what to do. We've got to get started, do the best we can, understand what we're doing, be developmentally appropriate, and let practice drive research. Let practice drive some of the better questions in research that are coming up. So that's part of what we're thinking. We certainly talked about limitations. I, I won't spend time on, on that with us. I think we are all um, kind of past some of that. Um, we need to be selective with the youngest children, that's true. Um, and then we, this issue around access, I think, is very critical. The other work that's going on parallel to this, any of you coming to Fred Forward in a few weeks in Latrobe, Pennsylvania? A few of you, maybe. Um, the Fred Rogers Center is also working on, and David Kleeman's been a, a leading um, person on this effort, uh, this framework for quality in digital media. So one thing to inform teachers of young children and another to help inform parents, consumers, and, and uh, media developers like, like you. And one of the things that this really focuses on, the child, the content, and the context. And I think those three C's are, are critical. And, and, and that idea comes from Lisa Guernsey, and you may know her uh, work as well. But I've been listening to a whole bunch of other C words get shared in the last three days. So child context content, right? But there's been a bunch of other C words that have been important to all of you. Control, child has control, child has choice, promotes creativity, allows for creation, encourages communication, enables and welcomes conversations, um, cooperation and collaboration as goals of, of, the, uh, of the experience, understanding the consequences, and then this no notion of co-viewing, co-engaging, co-creating. So a lot of C words in these last three days that I think are critical to the way we're thinking about this. So I want you to mind the gaps. And somebody's here from London, you know this sign very well, um, from the tube stations, but we need to think about how we're gonna mind these gaps. So for developers, the gaps between passive experiences and active experiences, between safety and appropriate risk. And we understand that in early childhood. It's not about safety and, no, and nothing but risk, it's about what's an appropriate risk for the child between distraction and attraction. I think that's a very important one. Between the imagination of the child, what the child can imagine doing, and what the affordances of the device and the app allow the child to do. And what's the gap between those two? Between drill and kill and open-ended experiences, between a solitary experience and a social one, between extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. So again, how big is your gap as you think about your own work? 
And then there's a few others, and certainly the app gap that Common Sense Media talks about, the difference between children in different socioeconomic groups and whether they have access to this technology or not, um, is a very critical and important issue for all of us. In early childhood, if we think technology really can make a difference for children, then it has to make a difference for all children. It's just that simple. It can't make a difference for some. And widen the gap. This is, we have tools in our hands now that could, in fact, shrink the gap, but we, have the, we, we run the risk of doing just the opposite. The achievement gap, certainly you, you know about that. Now, related to teachers, there's the knowledge, skills, and experience versus what we expect gap. I know very little about, about technology, but I'm expected to, to use these. Um, Chris said it the other day. If we hand a teacher an iPad, which is, we believe is a magical device, but give that teacher, male or female, no time to play, no time to really think about how it fits, and just say, take it in the classroom and create magic, it's going to fail. It failed in 1982 with Apple, with Apple IIe computers in classrooms when we didn't help the teachers understand how to use the technology. Participation gap's a big deal in early childhood education. We have tools. Teachers today um, have smartphones and iPads of their own, and yet don't use technology with young children in the classroom. So there's a huge gap. Teachers um, are not in the Twitter feed with all of us and, and doing these kind of things, so we have to bring that together. The next one I think is really critical. The gap between teaching and learning. I don't want your app to teach the child anything. I want the child to learn something from their experience with the app. That's not a subtle difference to me at all. That's a really important difference. We flip this over, right? It's all about learning. It's about learning. What will the child learn? What can the child learn? What's the learning uh, potential? What are the learning outcomes? So think differently about whether the app teaches the child to do something or whether the app opens an opportunity for the child to learn something. And then again, this notion between what do we know is good and, um, and how do we actually proceed. So we need to close the developmentally appropriate practice gap. What's, what is developmentally appropriate practice? What are the affordances of DAP? And what's the intentional intersection between DAP and app design? So the, the developmentally appropriate practice framework offers helpful guidance in using technology with young children and again considers the child, the context, and the content. So let me just flip through these. D DAP focuses on individualized needs. We've heard a lot about that. Age and developmental level. Mark was just talking about that social, cultural, and linguistic background of the child really looks at what is appropriate for the individual child and not what is appropriate for all two-year-olds or all four-year-olds, what's appropriate for this four-year-old, right? Uh, which requires a lot of knowledge. It recognizes the unique talents and interests of each child. It empowers children to reflect, to question, to create. Those are higher order experiences. It focuses on the role of social and emotional development and relationships with other children on the healthy development of the whole child. This is not just about cognitive development. It's about cognitive development, physical development, social development, emotional development. It's the whole child. That doesn't mean you can't have an app that focuses on the child learning a particular thing, but how do we put it in the context then of the whole child? It honors the val and values the relationship between children and the adults in their lives. That's very important. Very Fred Rogers, isn't it? So let's play words with developers. What are the key words you're supposed to take away? Huh. It's the same list I had up for teachers. These are the same words. Think about the same words. Tools, intentional, appropriate, effective, integrated, balanced, hands-on, interactive with interactions, engaging, co-engagement, and empowering. I'm asking us to consider the words the same way that, we, that we're asking teachers to. So to put a little more DAP in your app, if that's your goal, be intentional about your intent. Know why you're doing what you're doing. Be intentional about your intent. You can say what we think it's going to do, but I'd rather have you say why you believe it's going to do that. Attract instead of distract. Invite co-viewing, co-creating, and joint engagement. This, to me, is the most powerful part of this device. It's an invitation. It's an invitation for an adult and a child to sit down together and do something together, or for two children to do something together. This is really exciting. It's an invitation because the child can bring it to the adult and say, can we do this together? So consider that. Enable dialogic apping, right? We know what dialogic reading is, the notion of really asking questions and encouraging um, thought for the children. Let's, let's think about how we do that in our apps. Lots of concern now about ebook apps that are coming out where the parents are, are just turning on the ebook and not talking to the child anymore, not asking good questions, not having a dialogic reading experience at all. I worry about that. 
We have to nudge parents and teachers to extend the learning. How can you as app developers give me as a parent a little bit of, uh, of an information about what I can do and where I can go? Um, leverage what happens when the device is turned off. We've been talking only about what to do when the device is on. But Fred Rogers used to say, the best thing about television is when it's turned off. So what happens when, you, when this device is off? What, what's the extension? What do kids go do as a result of the experience they've had with you? And then never settle for good enough when it's for the children. It's just simply not acceptable. Let me, let me end here with Fred. Computers can be useful machines, especially when they help people communicate in caring ways with each other. So when you think of the youngest children, when you think of the, the children that Carly was talking about who are um, showing up in the, in the statistics as the, the number one category, continue to think about how your app supports relationships, supports interactions, encourages children to connect with adults, and then think about how you can use your app to, to nudge me as the consumer, as the father, um, to have a good conversation about what we were doing. So there you go. Just uh, keep your apps as dap as you can. Thanks.